was raised by parents who called themselves dead dog Democrats, which means they'd vote for a Democrat no matter what, even if it was a dead dog. I know that's kind of gross, but it shows how strongly they felt about being Democrats. My dad belonged to the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which was the electricians union, and my parents were also Catholic, so we were all immersed in Catholic social teaching. So in high school, in preparation for confirmation, I spent time studying with the Chicano community in Chicago, learning about liberation theology in Latin America. My parents were obviously deeply committed to social justice. I was in college before I ever ate a grape. They were boycotted at my house growing up in support of Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. So being part of a social justice movement was just a part of life growing up. It was part of being a good person. Picket lines and strikes and protests and boycotts, there was no question that this made a difference. It was understood that this was how the average person got their needs met and their voices heard. They banded together and stuck up for one another and made the fight for justice part of every day. I developed a deep appreciation for my parents and their social justice ethic this past year in one of my last classes in seminary, Strategic Nonviolence, taught by Dr. Sharon Welsh. In that class, we reflected on the history of social justice, what's worked and what hasn't, and asked ourselves the question, how do we make change when it feels like we're just one person or a small group of people and the system we're up against is large and powerful and seemingly impervious to our efforts. These days feel different than when I was a kid. We know so much more about the injustices of the world that it can feel overwhelming because there's so many needs and we have limited energy and limited time. And Sharon told us to ask ourselves, when we get involved in a social justice action, what's the strategy and is it sustainable? And are we just reacting to the symptoms of injustice or are we shifting the paradigm in a way that makes a difference? The grape boycott went on for 16 years and it was largely successful. It brought attention to workers' rights, allowed them to organize eliminated pesticides that were being used. It didn't solve the problem completely, but it made a difference and it continues to do so. And when I was in Sharon's class, I kept thinking about my parents and the unions. In order for the people to have power, we have to envision power in a new way. We have to be actively interdependent with one another. The more the authoritarian power categorizes us and seeks to separate us, the more we have to resist that separation and instead stick together, build relationships with one another and advocate for one another. This is the seventh principle of Unitarian Universalism, because the truth is that at our core, we are deeply interdependent, not just with other humans, but with all life on the planet. And respecting this interdependence means holding on to the humanity that authoritarianism strips from us. The more we're taught to be independent of one another, the more we are disconnected and dehumanized. The more we build community, the stronger we are. But interdependence can feel like loss for those of us who've been awarded power in this system, power based solely on our skin color or gender. In a world of scarcity, depending on another is viewed as weakness, as dangerous. But this is the authoritarian lie. And it's a lie that actually breeds dependency on the system rather than mutual interdependency on one another. The book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer presents us with the idea of a world of abundance where we not only depend on the natural world, but we honor its wisdom and its life. And I'm thinking of my parents and the huge vegetable garden they kept. They worked along with my aunts and grandparents, shared the harvest, And when there was more than they could eat or can, they gave it away. Family life and the rhythms of nature were in relationship and mutually interdependent. It's not just our responsibility to care for the earth, but with the earth, we're one organism. And in its aliveness, we nurture what gives us life physically and socially and emotionally. 
and the holy isn't just received from the good graces of an omnipotent father god or authoritarian overlord, but rather is a blossoming of relationship from our attention and care. What does this mean for our activism? As we're fed by our relationship to the natural world, spiritually and physically, we can identify what it is about this relationship that gives us life. We can work to create systems that support this sort of mutual interdependence and tear down the systems that don't. We can prioritize the knowledge of those who, like indigenous communities, have lived in interdependence with one another for thousands of years. And we can work to restructure our system so that this is the foundation of our relationships with one another. In order to be sustainable, it starts small. And in order to be strategic, it starts everywhere. It starts intentionally. If we identify ourselves as people who are working to live in mutual interdependence with the earth and with one another, we'll immediately discover the places in our lives and in our world that are suffering most. In your community right now, what is one small thing you can do to begin building a relationship with the earth and those around you that is interdependent, not dependent on the larger authoritarian system, but intentionally dependent on a relationship? Where can you put that little piece of intention? And as you use living with intention means living the fourth principle, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. But instead of freedom as an independent virtue, it becomes an interdependent virtue. This is how we make our social justice work a natural companion to our faith. When we are in relationship, living intentionally and making meaning from our lives, we are holding interdependence as one of our highest values. And concern for social justice is a natural outcome of this value. Rather than a place to hide from the pain of the world, to escape and feel at peace, our faith becomes the place where we engage with meaning making. Our activism becomes not a chore, but a way to be in community with one another and with the earth as a living prayer. In the Bible, it says to pray without ceasing. For you yous who believe in a beloved community of abundant interdependence for all creatures, our prayer is our social justice. And when we live it every day, setting our intention that this is the expression of our faith, we pray without ceasing. Boycotting those grapes is praying without ceasing. Being part of a community garden is praying without ceasing. Voting, recycling, planting a tree is praying without ceasing. The attitude is spiritual, but the action is justice. And it takes all the power away from those gods and humans who wish to control us and instead gives power back to the one organism that is the earth and the life it sustains. It all matters from the small actions to the large. Each day and each moment, we are called to live intentionally into this abundant interdependence and to trust that this organism, which knows itself through our consciousness, is changed by each action, and that these actions, when done in the abundant interdependence of joyful community, build together to shift the paradigm toward a sustainable future for all, toward change, making change.